Hello, my name is David Ades. I'm a poet based in Sydney and the host of a monthly poetry reading series called Poets Corner in association with West Words in Parramatta in Sydney's West. West Words is Western Sydney's literature development organisation. Poets Corner is part of West Words public programming that celebrates the richness, diversity and insight that literature offers. Especially in these times, we thank the ongoing support of Create New South Wales, the Cultural Fund of Copyright Australia, City of Parramatta Council, Blacktown City Council and Campbelltown City Council, as well as the many project partners that have enabled us to continue to provide opportunities to writers and audiences. We hope that this new world will see a sharing and a closeness of spirit. As you would know, each month I invite a poet to read poems and talk about them for an hour or so around a theme of the poet's choice. Our guest poet today is Jill Jones, who will read poems and talk on the theme of digressions, ambling and detritus, poetry as fieldwork. But first, an acknowledgement of country. I'm recording this from Beecroft in Sydney. Jill is recording from Adelaide in South Australia. I'd like to pay my respects to and acknowledge the elders past, present and emerging of the Wellamita people, the traditional custodians of the land in Beecroft and of the Ghana people, the traditional custodians of the land of the Adelaide Plains and to acknowledge also that they are the sovereign owners of their land, which has never been ceded or given up. Jill Jones was born in Sydney and has lived in Adelaide since 2008. Recent books include Wild Curious Air, winner of the 2021 Wesley Michelle Wright Prize, A History of What I'll Become, shortlisted for the 2021 Kenneth Slesser Award, and Viva the Real, shortlisted for the 2019 Prime Minister's Literary Award for Poetry and the 2020 John Bray Award. In 2015, she won the Victorian Premier's Prize for Poetry for The Beautiful Anxiety. And in 2003, the Kenneth Slesser Poetry Prize for Screens, Jets, Heaven, New and Selected Poems. Her first book, The Mask and the Jagged Star, won the 1993 Mary Gilmore Award. Her work is widely published in Australia and internationally and has been translated into a number of languages, including Chinese, French, Italian, Czech, Macedonian and Spanish. She has been an academic for a number of years, but has also worked as an arts administrator, journalist and book editor. Hi, Jill, and welcome to Poets Corner. Hi, David, um, and it's a real pleasure to be here. I'm and, always, I'm um, always fascinated. Sorry, no, that's right. I'm always fascinated by the themes that poets come up with for these podcasts and, and where they might lead. And I sometimes try to amuse myself by guessing what themes poets will come up with, and I, I never get it right. Um, there are endless possibilities, it seems to me, with the theme digressions, ambling, and detritus poetry as fieldwork. What was going through your mind when you came up with that theme? Well, um, I guess I was trying to give you a theme and um, I think I'm n notorious for saying I hate themes, um, <laughs> but you know, I, do, I do see the point of them. So um, goodness, I teach. So <laughs> uh, that's all about themes. But I was thinking about um, what, what do I do and particularly what I've been doing in the last two or three books. Um, and it seems that, and I, I caught the word digression that someone had mentioned somewhere else along the line. And I thought, yeah, that um, fairly adequately sums up a lot of what I do. I start <clears throat> somewhere and end up somewhere else. And it might be literally going for a walk and making some notes and um, then developing something from it. But it might mean doing some reading. And then, as we all know, particularly these days, once you start reading, you can go down a rabbit hole and end up somewhere else. Um, you know, whether it's other poets, um, some subject that um, you're interested in, any kind of reading like that. Um, and I guess um, <clears throat> the internet has made that a lot more easy, but I could go in my room and sort of go through the various piles of books that are in there and um, find out different ways of connecting some ideas in my head um, and try and work them out and what I might write as, um, I guess, um, a result of that, um, trying to make certain connections. Yeah. So if that makes sense. Yeah. No, I don't know if you saw the recent um, American Poets Association podcast on poetry as work um, featuring poets like Natasha Trethaway and others in an hour long discussion on that theme, 
the idea of field work connotes something a bit different to me of, of someone like an archaeologist or paleontologist out in the field searching to unearth the hidden or collecting data. It's a form of quest where you never know what you might find. And you, you sort of say you, you start somewhere and you end somewhere else. It's full of digressions, ambling and, and detritus, isn't it? Exactly, yes. And, I mean, even as we have all experienced, I'm sure a lot of us have experienced with the um, the, pan <clears throat> the pandemic and um, perhaps being locked down from going out further than your own neighbourhood. So you go out for a little walk around the neighbourhood to at least exercise yourself and you start to see what your neighbours are doing. You probably never noticed them before because I, I don't drive but I'm usually dashing for public transport. But if you drive, if you drive past it, you don't see it. Mm. Um, but if you sort of walk past each house and you think, oh, what are they doing there? People, um, yeah, particularly from last year, started to do a lot of home renovation because they wouldn't go anywhere else. All of a sudden you literally saw detritus on the street, you know, old chairs, old, um, um, you know, lamps and um, kids' toys, books, all sorts of things just there on the street. So literally detritus. Um, and, yeah, then you sort of start to discover things about what people might actually be doing and start to speculate about what all that's about. So that's the literal detritus that you'll see, let alone, um, sadly, the detritus that we now see where a lot of discarded face masks and things like that. And they're sadly probably heading for waterways. But anyway, that's... But then there's the detritus that finds its way into the ponds. Of course, yeah, of course. And um, then they might be literal observations of detritus or they may be when you're writing one poem and it's not working and you've got some other stuff somewhere else that you might go over and have a look at, pick it up, you know, in a metaphorical sense, turn it around, it gets into the poem or you start to cut things out of the poem and there might be only a little thing left um yeah that's all that sort of stuff but the other detritus of course is um the traces of other texts that get into the poems and um that that's certainly something in my last few books certainly the last two books um is quite clear that there's very much a trace or more than just a trace of text um in those poems mm. Um, all right, well, shall we read a poem? Yeah, yeah, well, and the first one I was going to read um, does exactly that. And um, it, um, I'll introduce it um, by saying it um, is quite deliberately a series of mistranslations, misunderstandings or loose versions of several fragments from Sappho. And if anyone was interested, I could probably even list... Um, the um, fragment numbers from the Lobel Page um, edition of the um, original um, ancient Greek or archaic Greek. But anyway, I'll just read the poem. Let's just enjoy the poem. It's called As Long As You Need Fragments. As if a cute voiced girl in the slack limbs of Eros, sweet and bitter, I still shudder. They say, don't disturb all that washed up trash. Now the sea's sour as death. Do I miss, still miss all that, darling? Remember our burlesque hearts and heads relaxing on sweaty breasts in Sydney's sun ecstasy, its dusk pink twinky hours. Remember making our way among shadowy electro shapes, no party too hot, no dance where we were absent. In an old century, of course, we did such flash young things, such wasted perfect time, such girls all those nights up long. My mind now cracks up as the world's fucked. Pink and purple blossoms rot on the footpath. If this is my shame or pride, I must speak for what the future will recall, even my own disturbing junk heap. Still, to the ends of the earth, desires all of them older, all of them younger, all now still lifting above the roof in fabulous style, just like honey, for as long as you need with these two arms. Yeah, well, there's detritus and trash and all that stuff c coming there already from the get-go. 
Yeah. Um, yeah, and it's interesting. I mean, okay, yeah, a lot of that's mistranslation and, of course, some of the... Um, the translating of Sappho is also debatable itself because some scholars fill in things that they think probably were there and some people just go literal, literal, literal. But, um, yeah, there is um, a bit of detritus in her work um, and, you know, I've updated it and mistranslated it for, um, I guess, a particular 21st century version of it. Um, yeah, but... And, and made fragments from her fragments. Mm, exactly. Yeah, and it's it's interesting to think about Sappho um, because, you know, a lot of people have um, speculated that the actual idea of the fragment and the rediscovery or, you know, interest, you know, early modernist interest in her work led to ideas about um, poets writing in a fragmentary sense in modernism and postmodernism. Um, not just poets, but other people as well. So um, I think it's, um, I always like to revisit Sappho as well as for the obvious um, reasons. Um, I think it's always worth going back and having a look at her work and to think about the fact that she was a poet who looked um, in the Mediterranean, both East and West, because she was you know, um, on Lesbos, which is um, quite near to modern day, um, you know, Turkey and um, what we now call the Middle East, yeah. Mm. Um, you note that this poem is a series of um, mistranslations, misunderstandings or loose versions. Um, there are multiple excavations going on here. Um, as you say, excavating fragments from Sappho, whose poetry only comes to us in fragments and doing what poets often do, mining your past. I suspect, and putting these things together almost as collage. Did mm. you have in mind with this poem a homage to Sappho or a conversation with Sappho or just riffing off her? Oh, to me, it was um, a homage um, and not just simply a riff off it. Um, because I think if you look at um, certainly my recent work, and you know, I can say, you know, in my own thinking that. Um, uh, you know, she's always in the back of my mind um, as, um, I guess, um, someone who illuminates some of my own thinking, um, thinking about the lyric, because in her work, the lyric wasn't just um, about the intimate, although, you know, she was certainly in the, the Western poetry tradition, um, one of the first poets who was, but not the only, who was interested in writing about the intimate uh, and the personal. But a lot of her um, poems, you know, not that we have much left of them, were, you know, um, you know for social occasions, for weddings and um, for praise, and um, they would have been sung um, out in public. So it starts to, right, even way back then, um, question what we now think is the lyric is just that sort of intimate interior um, kind of work that um, it, it did have a social function um, and the lyric, in a sense, was sung on a lyre. It was a performance as much as sort of um, a private um, poetry. Mm. And I think that's always important to bear in mind when we... Um, people talk about the lyric and people you know, make pronunciations about the lyric is dead and all that sort of stuff. And you think, well, what kind of lyric are you actually talking about? Are you really just talking about, you know, the, the romantic British poets of the, you know, um, late 18th, early 19th century, or are you talking about something else? Yeah, well, you, I mean, you're sort of referencing going back to the past by, by looking at Sappho, but I'm interested in your mindfulness of the future. Speaking, you know, for what the future will recall, which is also apparent in the title of the book from which this poem is taken, A History of What, what I'll Become. Mm. This is a very general question, but can you talk a bit about your gaze as a poet, how you look upon the world through poetry? <laughs> it's a very big question. I know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, well, to me, um, the past always seems to be in front of us and, um, and because... Yeah, that's the thing that we can see. We don't know the future. We can you know, predict, make predictions um, in all sorts of ways, um, whether they're um, you know, based on research or the toss of a coin. Um, but the past is always in front of us. We're always aware of it. We're always coming out of the past. 
Um, so I, I, um, I guess I always see the past, present and future is always there because the present is continually passing, isn't it? You know, we're sitting here talking um, and two minutes ago we were doing something else now you're talking to me about this, then I'm saying that. Um, and the future's um, always, um, uh, yeah, we're always thinking about the future, even though we're carrying it via the past or what's happening up to us in the moment. Um, I don't know if that makes any sense. Uh, I, I wrote a poem um, about, um, or I've written a few about looking at the stars. And of course, when we look at the stars, even the moon, um, we're seeing that in the past, that's the, it's past, the moon's past, the stars past, and it's traveled to meet us, but we're seeing it in the present. Um, and the future, who knows? But I guess the future, um, as we well know, um, is a huge um, problem because certainly for humans, the future's not looking very good. Um, that's, a, I guess, a slightly different issue, but um, that's always on my mind as well. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, would you like to read another poem for us? Yeah, certainly, certainly. Uh, and um, this next poem and the next few poems that I'm going to read is um, from my latest book, Wild Curious Air. And this is um, the first poem in the book. And it's called Deliberation on Sudden Days of Exceptional Brightness. There were lines of our life here along the street. Cars were all candid in their leaving. No one could make a decision. We meditated on timetables. We thought about spending wisely, massaging coupons. We became aware of sirens and strangers of early flights, all but solitude. Thought had drugged the music. It was reduced to interest rates, beautiful soft furnishing on night programs. Despite the poster's green outline, it was old politics, teacups, amiable kickbacks. Doors closed. There were only clicks. Poets made words of little boats. The air could not be still. Yet, how sanguine the rain became between the lightning. The sky rhymed with 747s, Cessna's drones. We were still there, washed in discordant fashion sense. There was a gulf that didn't allow sleep. Choices were wrapped in colours of the same size. It was clear at this stage, but inevitably failing. There were also exceptional bright days, almost as if weather could no longer alarm us. It was not the time to hate everything, but not quite the time to dance. We gave up determining fences. We'd ask, who is my enemy or post? Do not abandon these words, as if that was the answer. Is every poem a deliberation, Jill? <laughs> No, I don't <laughs> think so. Um, I think some of them um, may be considerations. Um, some of them just float, I think. Um, but some of them may be deliberation. I don't know whether you think that in your work but, um, and what other poets think. Uh, I change my mind all the time about these things anyway, but, um, yeah. Um, you, you've collected all sorts of fragments in this poem, fragments of thought, fragments of image, fragments of awareness and being. Are you trying in this poem to make the fragments of these um, sudden days of exceptional brightness cohere, or are you simply assembling them to depict a fragmented experience? Well, I think there's an element of both. I mean, the fact that I've decided to you know, put it in a, um, a poem and give it a title um, means that I'm um, thinking about some kind of coherence, but what that coherence means will um, probably differ from each person who reads it. I mean, the original um, text, the Ur text, if you want to call it like that, was something I wrote almost 20 years ago. Um, and out of that, it was um, a, a listy kind of poem called 
62 footnotes for a lost text on the spring campaign. I think um, I was, um, I think it might have been just after um, when Labor lost another election. <laughs> I was living in Sydney um, and that poem never went anywhere, but I had all these in a sense, it was a list, it was a fragment of 62 things. It was originally a hundred, but I think I discarded a lot of it. Um, it never got anywhere as a poem, um, probably quite rightly. And in the end, I um, extracted some, some of those things that did, even though they were fragments, they sort of connected and made another poem um, that was in a book of mine published some years ago called Ashes Here, So Are Stars. It's a, it was a prose poem in the end. And that's interesting, an interesting decision that I make, made. And there were two phrases in it that um, do connect with this current poem. But there were things that really needed to go over into that poem and to become a prose poem to, in a sense, um, unpack the idea of list and to give it a little bit more not a narrative, but um, sort of a different kind of way of connecting it. And this one um, has um, become that poem, um, which has, um, you know, those um, four stanzas, four fairly regularly con constructed stanzas. And I think even if a poem is full of fragments, even the Sappho poem, you know, the uh, one that references Sappho, I've still tried to, through the use of form, give them some kind of coherence, mm. even though they're fragmentary. And I think that's one way, certainly, that I do it, um, to think about form mm. um, and kind of uh, you know, regular stanzas or other ways of using form to somehow give a form to the fragmentary. But it's not up to me to decide how people will read those fragments and to read those connections. No, but it does sort of point to the difference between hearing a poem and seeing it on the page mm. um, and, and how you can connect to it in different ways, depending on which one of those things you're doing. Um, can you talk about the last line as if that was the answer and how the idea of leaving the answer unresolved interfaces with your work as a poet? Sure, yes. Well, I mean, I'm certainly I can state that I'm not um, interested in providing answers to anything <laughs> um, and um, you know how, how dare I even um, think that I could do that um, and answers to what what is what is your question um, and uh, but I think the poem itself because you know um, it's looking at what's going on in the media what's going on, even if we look up, go outside and look at what's going on with, you know, large planes, small planes, and then drones, um, who's looking at us, um, where are we travelling? It's, you know, it's very much um, about externals. Um, but, um, and, and people, you know, are obviously, some people I think are looking for answers um, to, I guess, the mess that we're in. But sometimes I think it's not an answer that perhaps, well, at least I'm looking for. It's just I'm here, we're here, um, we're in a moment, um, what's going on here? And if it's a sudden day of exceptional brightness, mm -hmm. unless it's a sudden day of exceptional brightness and it's too hot, but if it's um, not too hot, it can bring um, some lightness to literally and metaphorically to living um, and instead of running around trying to um, put forward answers maybe it's just again the field work what is going on here mm. um, and you're just a human being and you're just one being and out there is all the other um, elements um, other um, beings um, vegetation, detritus, um, the air, water, whatever's going on. Um, and we're just a part of that. We're responsible for what we've done to it, of course, um, but we're just a part of it. So I guess that's um, 
that's not an answer. That's just being in the world. Well, I mean, the poetry is probing the questions. Mm. Oh, yes, yes. I mean, um, it, you know, yeah. Um, yeah, people are sort of thinking, what is, you know, what can we do? Um, but, you know, um, you can't, you, there's no sort of, there's no one answer to that. Uh, but uh, but if you don't ask the questions, you're not going to ever find anything. So mm. so the poetry and and I mean I, I I get the sense that you're a kind of restless prober because there's so much poetry coming. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean I'm I'm restless um, and always have been, um, and certainly around language, um, and you know I'm always you know noting down something, you know it might sit there for I mean literally. Um, part of this poem sat there for 20 years mm. um, so I know some people sort of say I write a lot well I don't write much more than a lot of other people if you actually did the research which I have just to counter that kind of um, comment but um, I just note down things and sometimes I keep a good track of it sometimes I don't you know 10 years later I'll find something in a file either digital or paper, and I think, oh, that seems to link to something I'm doing now. And I guess that's the other thing, getting back to our previous discussion about past, present and future, um, there's always something that I've done in the past, thought about, um, written a little bit about that does still connect with what I'm thinking about now. Um, that's, the, and, that's the longevity of fieldwork too, isn't it? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, if you you keep those notes, and I mean, I don't know if you've you've ever had this experience. And I uncovered something recently, and I thought, did I actually write that? Mm. Um, and I did. Um, I didn't copy it from somewhere else, um, and I'd forgotten. Or and then I looked at it again. I thought, oh, there's a bit of that I remember now, and I can't quite remember the circumstance, but something's there's something going on there. And um, it is something maybe over summer I might go back and have a look at and see if I can do something with it. So, as I say, um, for instance, a lot of, um, even though um, I've been living in Adelaide since 2008 and most of the poems that are in the books that have been published since then or poems um, come out of the experience of living here, um, in every single book there's at least one poem if not more that really is something I wrote when I lived in Sydney and that one that I just read out is, is one of them um, so there's still that old work that still needs more work some of the detritus needs to be cut out of it <laughs> um, and remade for perhaps and, and some of it will never come to anything yeah just, and when you sort of say that um you know, you, you had to stop and think whether you wrote that. I mean, in a sense, it was a different you who wrote that. Mm. Yeah, yeah, different time, um, uh, different circumstance. And, you know, I think that, um, you know, where I live is um, something that always gets into the work. And so sometimes to me it's odd when I put um, – poems that I wrote in Sydney or indeed somewhere else in the world and that's that too um, into the book the a book with current poems that I've written you know literally perhaps perhaps even sitting at this table that I'm talking to you from now mm. yeah. should we read another poem yeah sure great thing yep um, this one um, it has a um, little epigraph um, from a book uh, by um, John Berger. Um, I'll just read out the epigraph and then I'll read out the poem. And it does refer um, a little bit to the discussion I already started about looking up into the sky. Mm -hmm. So the quote from Berger is, the problem of time is like the darkness of the sky. And the poem is called The Moon and Taris and the Dead as well. We don't see our faces in the stars tonight or any night. They're older than faces. What do we do with the problem of time? I wonder what rivers do 
or estuaries, atoms, clouds, constellations in their time. All those traces as threads, so even the absent are present, the dead as well, as though there's a perimeter, an edge to the realm that's not us. Look, there's the past, the crescent moon, and above it Venus, then Jupiter, and further up the sky, Antares in Scorpius. The moon's light takes just over a second to reach our faces. That light from Antares left itself just before the birth of Galileo. Always a past that touches us as this hot January forgets us. To imagine Galileo on such a night, as if he might walk here still, looking for ancient heat above this heat. This pulse of a big old story is far from our traffic and trees, our grounds, levels and hollows. We don't hear it. We can only think and feel into this time, our time, that remembers the living and all that the living are not. But the dead aren't us, nor are they stars, despite all the names up there. Someone left a beer bottle next to the street tree. I hear voices in a yard nearby, who's speaking at this hour, charging the night. Maybe in the dark, things are more tolerable. Maybe in the dark, you're not yet born. Tonight's cold, thin moonlight falls onto their faces. Hear them laughing, not loudly, like a conspiracy of being with, maybe together outside. Close your eyes and keep them open. Maybe turned upwards into the past or towards me now. The past as now to come where we are also in past light, coming light. Yeah, well, that's a, it's a big subject, isn't it? And it's beautifully put. Um, it certainly made me think, this is one of your, uh, from the poems that you're reading today, one of your more narrative mm. linear poems. So I'm gonna to come to that question about um, your poetic style a bit later on. But one of the things that characterizes us as humans is our ability to ponder, to digress and amble and wander in our thoughts, to take time out from the everyday, the quotidian, mm. the beer bottle next to the street tree and the voices in the nearby yard, to wander about, as you put it, the pulse of a big old story. Do you think that goes to the heart of your work as a poet? Yeah, I think um, that's pretty close to... It's certainly at the moment that, to me, it's um, it's often about the quotidian. Here we are, you know, this you know, crap in the street, you know, crap in our houses. Um, yet you walk out and you can look up at the stars, or even looking up at clouds. I've got a whole a poem I wrote, you know, in part looking at clouds. It's not one I'm reading today, and. Um, you think, yeah, that's about elsewhere as well as here. I'm standing here and I'm looking up at the moon, I'm looking at the clouds, but the clouds indicate um, changes in atmosphere and weather. Um, the moon, you know, waxes and wanes and does its moon stuff. And then there's all those stars. Um, and certainly one of the benefits of living in Adelaide rather than Sydney is that even in suburbia, you can go out and see more stars than you could in Sydney. Yeah. Although I remember when I was a kid in Sydney, you could actually see a lot more or for obvious reasons. And so you realise that, you know, you're just one tiny pinprick planet in amongst, you know, huge universe. And the stuff been going on there for, you know, what, trillions and zillions of years. Yet you're here in a place now um, and what do you do with what you've got in this particular place? Um, that's a bit of a long thing, but that's, that's how I think, you know, for good or ill, and that's how I work in my work and how I've always done it. Um, there's, you know, the sense of scale. I'm quite happy to work with it, you know, within one poem or over a series of poems. Mm. Uh I've got three kids and one of them's six next week and is on a screen at the moment as I'm keeping him away from this screen. Mm -hmm. uh, I worry uh, with the ever increasing intrusion of devices in our lives that we are depriving future generations of this mental wandering. Um, is, that, is that part of your message in this poem with your admonition to close your eyes and keep them open? 
I, in a, I mean, yeah, in a sense, um, I don't know that when I wrote that I was specifically thinking of what you're thinking, but um, yeah, I can see how yeah you could um, think yeah go there, and that certainly worries me. I mean. I'm, for instance, um, you know, I'm stuck at home at the moment because, you know, I've got this temporary injury and I can't literally even, you know, I've been in my house for four weeks. And so often I'm looking at um, a device, um, mainly just to catch up with people. And I kind of think I would just love to throw away these crutches I've got, get the moon boot off and just literally walk out the door and go for a walk up the street. Mm. Um, and look around, um, sniff the air, you know, feel the air, um, et cetera, et cetera, instead of, you know, um, I've got probably got a, no, the phone's over there. Um, and it, that, that does worry me. And I, I um, yeah, people speculate, does it change our brains and all the rest of it? But um, just to literally get out and um, to be in this um, real place rather than the virtual um, and to feel it, to smell it, to taste it, because um, you can taste things on the air, you know, to pick up bits of dirt and taste them. I mean, when I was a kid, you used to do stuff like that. Um, do kids still do things like that? I don't know. I mean, for instance, um, sort of perhaps harping on something that's perhaps relevant or not relevant. I don't drive, so I do a lot of walking or public transport. But the other thing I've noticed when I was a kid, um, which was thousands of years ago, I used to walk to school um, and I was rarely ever driven to school. Um, and at one stage in my life, I was living, my parents moved, but I was still trying to finish primary school. And I had to journey from, and Sydney people would know this, I was going to a school in Artarman, so I had to get the train to North Sydney, get off the train and then get on the 190 bus to go out to the northern beaches um, and I did that for a whole term by myself as a little primary school girl um, and didn't really think much about it you just did it and now all these kids are being zoomed around in cars um, and you know to keep them quiet they're put on devices to keep us quiet we're put on devices it is worrying so but to get back to poetics and field work, um, I mean, you can do certain sorts of field work um, on the digital devices, and yeah, we will do that. Well, I certainly do it. But I'm desperate to get out that door um, and to get back um, just to walk up to the Oval or to um, cross the railway. You hear a train just going now, um, and just check out what my neighbours are doing, or to go into the city, walk through the botanical gardens. Well, walk through the city. I mean, um, and just see what people are doing. Yeah. Well, uh, lockdown has been very interesting. The four months that we had in Sydney, because so I've been living in where I'm living for nearly three years, um, and uh, we were forced <laughs> to walk around everywhere because mm. we couldn't drive. We couldn't go more than five kilometres away anyway. Right. Mm. Um, and we've discovered whole pockets of the neighbourhood that we had no idea about. Mm. Yeah, uh, and that that was forced on us because it doesn't happen otherwise. Yeah, yeah, uh, and yeah. it's kind of it's kind of lost. You know, it was wonderful to see so many people walking out in the streets. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's what happened, and yeah, you know, we've got to know some people that we didn't even know before. Mm. Um, and or even if you didn't get to know them, you'd stop and talk to someone about what they were doing, and they would just instead of rushing around, they would stop and talk to you um, about their garden or what's going on in the world or they'd ask you a question about what you were doing, all this sort of stuff. Um, and, and, and people, I mean, there were plenty of exceptions, but people became more helpful because they saw you and knew that you weren't sort of, you know, just a blow-in, but um, someone that, you know, they could ask for some help about and so we've got to know people that we never thought we would get to know which is good and yeah as you say you, you find pockets of um stuff going on um in the so-called boring suburbs that aren't boring at all um, no. and that's the other thing people think oh suburbia is so boring 
um, and look, Adelaide suburbia is very suburban, but there's still a lot going on um, and there's a lot going on in people's lives and you can see the way people live um, and think about, particularly when you talk to them, about what's going on for them. Sometimes it's good and sometimes it's not so good. Um, yeah, and then think about what does that mean and how disconnected we can be, if, how disconnected I feel right at this moment, just literally sitting inside waiting for, you know, my Achilles tendon to knit up again yeah. um, before I can actually get out there. Mm. Well, let's get close with another poem. Yeah, yeah, let's do that. Yeah. Radio. Um, and this is another poem, I guess, about getting out and walking around. And it's titled, I Walk as a Jittery Mortal. I walk out into the curious air. I trip on matter that's going cold. I feel earth as thrust, metal and scrape. I look at each plant for belief or breath. Their brights unveil me as shadow or guest. I want to feel a whole lot better than quiet. I'm singing like a lost chorus of one. Damp and grit play giddy round my shoes. I step through it, nothing quite catches. Afternoon rain begins its restlessness. Air is my home, I entered it dripping. Now here's the jittery earth. Now here's crust and brown flare, a muster of body for bodies. Out here, I hardly know myself, finally. Sorrow isn't something I'd name. It would only sound nostalgic or sappy. This world isn't mine. Here, I'm a mortal subject. There are cold things I can't brush away. A jittery mortal on the jittery earth. Mm. It sounds tenuous. Yes, yes. Well, um, I've always felt a bit tenuous on earth for various reasons. Um, <clears throat> some of them physical. Um, apart from anything else, um, I have a, a vertigo condition, <laughs> so I've got to be a bit careful. Um, and also, particularly, I think I've always felt a bit um, tenuous for all sorts of reasons, but certainly when you think about what's going on, or the way um, humans have, um, <clears throat> you know, and continuing to destroy, to destroy the world, um, and what will happen to humans in the future um, makes one feel pretty tenuous. And I guess trying to think myself out of, um, you know, humans understand things and the rest of the world doesn't, we're in charge, they're not, not that I ever thought I was in charge of anything. Um, yeah, I'm sort of trying to get away from that, but, but literally um, some of it's to do with my own physicality. Um, I won't bore people with that, but um, yeah, never felt particularly um, balanced on the earth. Yeah, I mean, it comes across a little bit. The, the narrator here says, I'm using the word narrator, yes. um, air is my home and then the world isn't mine. Mm. So that narrator wants to feel a whole lot better than quiet. And yet there is disquiet in this poem, isn't there? And unbelonging, as Nathaniel O'Reilly would put it. Mm. Is the narrator not at home in the world? I suppose you've answered that question. Well, um, if I can just go back on that, even if I feel tenuous, I mean, it is, you know, I'm a human being. I was born into this world. I'm here still. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I may not be here much longer. Who knows? I mean, you, know, in the, you can walk out and get run over by a bus, but, um, and I'm not young. But um, it is... Um, you know, I'm mortal and I'm, you know, a subject in the world like everything else. So in saying that I'm tenuous, I'm also saying I'm hoping that I'm saying um, that doesn't absolve me of responsibility of being here in the world and of trying to, you know, negotiate it, um, not just on my terms, but, um, you know, on much broader terms, um, I probably do it fairly unsuccessfully, but um, you know I'm here. Um, you know I entered it dripping, um, and um, I've got to negotiate it, even though it's sometimes difficult. So 
I, I'm hoping that there's that sense of the, the restlessness and the tenuousness, but also acknowledging here I am. Yeah, I, mean, I think it resonates because we're all in the same boat, really. Um, I was interested in the line, out here I hardly know myself finally, which suggests to me that the not knowing was a goal that has finally been achieved. Yes, um, I think in the sense of um, that total self-confidence about hope you know, I am, um, to actually to let go of that and to think of knowing perhaps in, in a different way of knowing as being part of something else and therefore not as a separate me, um, uh, as a kind of a goal. But you've always got to sort of think, well, you've got to be responsible for me, but to think of me as not just, you know, the one thing, um, the centre of the world. And I mean, to some extent, to get through every day, you've got to, to an extent, you know, have that, um, as opposed to tenuous, tenacious, and I've got to be pretty tenacious at the moment with <clears throat> crutches on the floor, do not fall over, Jill, do not fall over. <clears throat> but to stick with it, but also um, to admit that you're not the centre of everything. I guess it's really that. Yeah. But, of course, you know, to simply write a poem, to publish it and to put it in a book means, you know, you're centering yourself. <laughs> you, can't, you can't escape that. <laughs> yeah. But, I mean, it's... I mean, shedding light on on a way of thinking, though, and 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 um, probably now more than ever, I think people are starting to be conscious of the fact that you know there is a broader responsibility and there there is a footprint, and um, we are part of something bigger, and and it's all interdependent. And uh, I think I think that sort of is one of those um, conscious raising things about poetry that you know makes me gravitate towards poetry um that from from poems like that i think and i need to think and it makes me think so it's a good thing okay um i think your next poem is it doesn't hurt to fall off the moon is that oh, right? Right. yes and um i should just introduce it by saying <clears throat> that the the title, It Doesn't Hurt to Fall Off the Moon, is English translation, some dialogue from um, a film by Jacques Rivette called Céline et Julie Vont en Bateau, Phantom Ladies Over Paris, which is the full title. Um, and people would probably know it um, in English as Céline and Julie Go Boating. And the poem, if you know the film, does refer to... Um, directly and indirectly to some scenes in the film, but I'm hoping that those of you who've never seen the film, although I recommend it, um, that the poem makes sense despite or because um, you don't need to know. It doesn't hurt to fall off the moon. When night is naked, it risks as much as us. My mind spills like water. You launch yourself into it. Even while we're kidding around, I unpack all your knots. What if we try this? What if we change each other? Knots are possibilities. I weave them out of themselves tenderly, curiously, like a charm or a plot difficult to relate. How do women chase each other? Teamwork, I guess, as we put each other on, exchanging clothes neither of us need. It becomes beautiful slapstick. We fall into and out of each other as reflections across a lake. The night isn't tame or duplicitous. We stroke and steer by the hours. Your breath is my river. I row with you into morning. So I haven't seen the movie, mm -hmm. but I love the, I love the poem. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's a whole world in those last two lines, your breath is my river, I row with you into morning. And to me, you know, lines like that uh, exemplify the magic of poetry because you know, as a reader, you can go so far with lines like that. It can take you so many places. There's a lot of ambling there. Oh, yeah. Um, and film's full of ambling. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's a beautiful love poem, and, and uh, to me anyway, and 
and what poet doesn't aspire to write beautiful love poems and what reader of poetry doesn't want to read a beautiful love poem. But what else is this poem, Jill? Uh, well, I mean, it's about um, ambling is, um, is certainly one of it. Um, and I think the other thing is it's about, um, well, it, it's a love poem, surely, but it's also about um, close relationships, even if we, we were talking about friendship rather than um, um, a love poem. And I guess if I was making a point is um, about female friendships that aren't based on um, competition Mm. Um, so that how do women chase each other? And the two women in the film um, do chase each other. And it's a moot point whether it's a very close female friendship or whether there's a lesbian subtext and, you know, people argue about that. Um, let's just stick with a really close friendship because, in fact, the two actresses were close friends, as it so happened. Um, but how do women chase each other? Teamwork, I guess. Mm. And it's that idea of instead of chasing being a competition, um, they end up um, working as a team, um, even though they are sort of following each other around to do things. So it's um, looking at relationships, or close relationships, intimate relationships of any kind in a different kind of a way. Um, and also there's, I guess, an element of... Um, who are we when we um, dress up and exchange clothes? Um, who are we, um, you know, in certain sorts of, yeah, because, you know, we're performing all the time and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, yeah, we've got different sort of masks that we put on. And I guess I'm thinking about um, what those masks sometimes can do. And, um, you know, in the film, um, um, yeah, there's a sort of a strange little um, internal plot that works itself out. And um, the, women, the women try and subvert this sort of um, strange thing going on in a house by continually um, subverting the dialogue. Um, so I think that that's interesting that you don't have to be caught um, in a sort of trap of a relationship. You can change things in it. Um, not a possibility. So even if you might tie something, um, you can untie them and weave them in different ways. Um, so that's mm. some of the things that I was thinking about. I mean, as I say, I'm riffing off the film, but I don't think, well, well you didn't need to see the film to get the poem. Mm. Um, if you see the film, you'll um, also know some extra stuff. Yeah. So um, not I'm talking about. I heard an actor not long ago say that when she acts, she's freer than when she's not acting because it enables her to inhabit a role other than herself. Mm. And um, there's an element of that in, in sort yeah. of changing clothes and changing and role playing, if you like, and, mm. and, and being other than who you are stuck with. Yeah. Uh, I mean, there's sort of the other side of that, of course, and um, that's certainly from um, what you might call a queer or LGBTQ, et cetera perspective in that um, for a lot of um, uh, queer people you have to pass, that is perform or put on a mask um, still these days um, and certainly in, in a lot of countries you have to be very, very careful and you do have to put on masks and so what do you do with them? And, of course, um, there's the other issue around, yeah, the other um, way of performing is drag um, and those sorts of things or indeed just acting. Um, and, you yeah, know, we all act and we all perform. Um, and as I say, people kind of think, oh, this is, you know, you're just, it's just a performance. Well, it's all performance. And if I can just sort of put in a, a little thing here, I mean, I'm a very shy person, I'm extremely shy. You do not know how shy I am. But it was partly through learning to get up on, um, in front of a mic to read poems that uh, um, I was able to, through learning to see that as a performance, um, and I actually did a little bit of, I, I paid a friend of mine who'd um, done some performance work to help me 
do that through some breathing and some other sorts of exercises that I actually felt that I could get up on stage and not freeze. Um, I mean, that's a long time ago. Um, so now I can get up in front of students and talk to them. Um, and um, to learn how to perform is quite um, liberating. Yeah. Well, here's a confession. Jill, I first met you, you won't remember this, at the Salt and the Tongue Festival in Goa, mm -hmm. where I hovered around but never actually came up to say hello because I was too shy. <laughs> so, there you go. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I do um, that all the time. I hover and I think, well, I won't, I will, I won't, I will, I won't. No, and I run away. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to get over that. Mm. Um, shall we read another poem? Excellent. we Will do. Um, and this is um, a long poem um, and it's a series of small poems put together. So it's one of those poems that sort of takes smaller things, fragments, if you like, and knits them together into a longer poem. And um, I'll just explain that um, there's epigraphs to each section from um, different books that I'd been reading at the particular time. And um, the poem and, you know, the um, gesture towards the idea of the symposia um, is, you know, deliberate. The poem overall is called Symposium of the Unfinished. And then I've got little um, subheadings um, and epigraphs. So that's just by way of explanation. Symposium of the Unfinished and random. I can only circle, roll and bart. Out walking, I see a circle of ants dispersing and joining. It looks purposeful and random, like rain or infection, like whatever I might call agitation for this world, word or that, to join or scatter. How I move. The project repeats me, the project incompletes me, Fred Moten. The body, the performer, reciting its own typos, its illegibility as movement, juggling amazements. That smell on the skin, desire moves, eros is a verb, and Carson. The ancient palimpsest, that GPS, I smell you like a memory. I remember whenever I see you, shadow or bright, and memory feeds the skin, the page, never spotless and always hungry. The new loss. Feeding the pages to the flame, Banu Kapil. Burning the skin, the page, the inky stench, the courage of it as well to dissolve in air and after ash, the loss in the ground is new. Dislike. I too dislike it, Marion Moore. Contempt is as genuine as any other art and sometimes more true like a canker, an itch, a need. Faltering, a feeble shadow of an original conception, Ben Lerner. Sad as breakfast or an empty train, rattle of technology faltering in the loaded quantum of autumn air, echo of a crowd across the bare oval. Around the genuine, meaning, is more of a dance, Noir al -Sadir. The curve of a bowl breaking or a street, a hand letting go, the way life contracts to a room or rises over the world with wings or bombs, satellite, eclipse, sung in the static. The next day and the next are unfinished. Sentences looking like rain in syllables, ash unsettles, walking a circle around the genuine, the faltering, unfinished, remember, Amazement eclipse, the body betrays what it loves by saying it loves its betrayals. Um, I'd like to ask you how these somewhat disparate vignettes coalesced into a poem. That's a good question. Um, and some of the um, pieces that I wrote early on last year in the pandemic made their way into it. The, the first one about the ants and I was just walking along a path and there was very definitely a whole 
amp thing going on as we <laughs> see them doing that thing. And the um, the one um, with the epigraph from Ben Luna was um, at the time going up to the Oval, which is just up around the corner. And, um, yeah, it's there was no one practising there. Nothing could happen. Yeah, everything was empty. So it, I had a couple of poems that I'd been writing as a result of going out walking. And because even though I was still teaching, but I was teaching from home, I had time to do a bit of extra reading for reasons that I won't particularly go into. Um, I'd been thinking or rereading a bit of Roland Barthes' The Pleasure of the Text, you know, obviously English translation. Um, I actually had been reading it and the thing in that reminded me of Emily Dickinson and that's that connection that's in another poem in the book. Um, but I guess I was also thinking about Eros in connection with being locked down. I mean, with my partner, so that's, but I was thinking of, you know, people separated and what that means. Um, and I'd been reading Carson just the year before, so I kind of went back to it. So you can see, you start sort of, you, you're kind of looking around for something to do and to read. And I went down a few rabbit holes, I guess, because we were, you know, not so much as in other states, but we were semi-locked down. Um, and for instance, um, if you read Ben Lerner's book, The Hatred of Poetry, um, and that quote of his, of course, refers back to um, Plato, um, of the shadow, you know, the cave and the shadow, that sort of thing. But he also references Marianne Moore. So, yeah, things started to sort of coalesce in my thinking, and I thought, of the idea of the symposium in that ancient idea of, you know, people getting together and having a bit of a, um, uh, you know, a few too many drinks and a bit of a bite to eat and a bit of a chat afterwards. I mean, I'm sort of mischaracterising it a bit, but that kind of thing. So I'm thinking about what if I'm chatting away to, you know, all of these other poets, both past and present, and what might happen if I looked at some of their work and tried to see how it fitted in with some things I was either doing, literally, um, or thinking about this, yeah. So that's, mm. and, and, you know, I had some other stuff going on, but it was these eight in the end which seemed to somehow, for me, coalesce. But it, it, it's, it's an idea of something that's unfinished. I mean, you could keep talking and talking and I could have brought in other um, uh, thinkers or poets um, because two of the, three of the books or I'm referring to aren't books of poetry they're books of um, broadly speaking literary criticism or, um, and philosophical speculation about texts etc yeah um, I mean it looks it looks both purposeful and random mm. Yeah, um, that's what and, it is. And, and and that it's unfinished is very appealing because you, you just get the sense that you could just keep adding to it. Mm. Um, yeah, I restrained myself. Um, <laughs> and, and that's the thing, and we were talking about that before, that even if something sort of is a bit floaty and fragmentary, by putting it into some kind of form, um, it's um, then... It, it give, you give it some kind of coherence or some sort of connection. Mm. Um, now, I mean, I obviously see connections here that um, I don't necessarily expect people to see. Um, and, I mean, like not all of the poems in Wild Curious Air, but quite a few of them, they do come out of um, what was going on, you know, say around March, April last year. Mm. Um, so they're quite recent poems. And this was, I guess, a way of thinking about the fragmentary because of what was going on and how to sort of bring it together, but also let that unfinished idea still float around the poem. And um, the, it's, um, the lines are all um, form-wise, you wouldn't tell it from me reading it out loud, but if you look at it, they're all quite short lines. Mm. 
um, and partly um, that was to do with, with, if anything, about going out for short walks instead of long ones. Mm -hmm. Would you say that um, every poem is, in a sense, unfinished? Yeah, and I think, um, what do people always quote what Paul Valerie or one of those poets that said that all poems are unfinished? And I, well, certainly in my case, yes. Um, you know, I, you know, sometimes when I published a poem, uh, had a poem published in a journal, and then I want to put it in a book, I sometimes revise it. Mm. Um, and sometimes I still look at some of my poems and think, oh, no, I'd get rid of that now. <laughs> or I'd add this. Um, I'd call it something else. Yeah. <laughs> and some of them, of course, you sort of just think, could we just never read this poem again? <laughs> <laughs> well, let's read another one. Yeah, okay. All righty. And um, this one, um, its title is taken from the second of the Alice in Wonderland books, um, Through the Looking Glass and What Alice Found There. And that um, book was a favourite text of the um, Argentinian poet Alejandro Pizanic. And the poem itself, again, it's one of these poems that riffs off um, someone else's um, work. And it riffs off some scenes from a film about her um, sadly short life and about her work in general. And it's a film called Alejandro, if anyone's um, read any of her work or interested in her, um, it's freely available on um, YouTube if you want to look at it. It's simply called Alejandro. So the quote uh, is, I only wanted to see what the garden was like. And that's Alice um, talking to the Queen. Anyway, whether slovenly or splendid, I'm leaning into the darkness yet again as if I was a disbanded girl whose lucid life was called inside. My smashed vision misses everything but the detours and shade. How should I make myself different with an identity pass or redactions? I have boxes of medicine for everything, flowers of sulphur and restoratives, amphetamine lip balm. I tremor before reality. I have no electronic desire. I spend an hour staring at a verb, it stares back, it knows I'm fraudulent. I think about my dreams of mutiny and burn the poems. I have this old memory of objects on a table, a blind mirror, a severe dark rose, a cruel figurine. Who will explain them to me? Or how to re-enter the world in the morning as a child in the garden, unreachable and endless. Uh, I've not come across uh, Alejandro Pizanic before, so I'll, I'll look up the film. Mm -hmm. Did you want to say something about, about her and her poetry and a, about the film? Sure, yeah. Well, um, the film's quite, it's only about an hour long, um, and um, so it tries to you know, piece together um, what's known of her life. Um, and, you know, even though she was um, born in um, Argentina, uh, you can tell from uh, her surname that um, her parents had um, come from Europe. Um, there's a lot of people that fled from Europe, you know, um, before, during and after um, various um, uh, pogroms and holocausts. Um, and she, um, she also spent some time in Paris and um, part of my poem responds to um, what she did there um, and she was um, pretty much involved with the avant-garde in Paris. Um, um, she was um, well known by um, a number of the people there in the 60s um, but the film itself tries to unpick you know her inner life. Um, um, it does it reasonably well just for a thing that goes for an hour. Um, some people who's I, I know no Spanish um, who say that the English translations are a little bit dodgy, but you know, to live with that. Um, and it goes into her personal diaries. But um, for good or ill, um, she was addicted to amphetamines. And, of course, they were quite 
legal and easy to get, you know, um, in the 50s and 60s that were given to soldiers to keep them awake and um, women took them to lose weight. I remember it was, you know, ads for things years ago. Um, and she, suddenly she became addicted to them. And, um, and she did a lot of writing at night. Now, you know, using speed and staying up late at night, um, you know, that does work. Um, because it's stay awake while you're sort of contemplating the night. Um, and, but it did take its toll. And the reference to the, um, the boxes of medicine, um, that's apparently someone who helped her, she moved around a lot when she was living in Paris um, before she went back. Um, they said that um, she just had these cases of medicine and as well as, yeah, the drugs she was taking, you know, there are all these other things that she was trying to sort of self-medicate for, for all sorts of things. Um, a lot of people do that at these times. Um, but um, she obviously ended up being um, severely depressed. She was institutionalised and in... 1972, she overdosed on Secondal at the age of 36. Um, she was interested um, in, I think, you know, she wrote a lot about night, um, about um, the space between language and place and the body and the mind um, and desire. Um, she was at least bisexual. And of course, that would have been difficult um, in those times, both in Argentina, but also, you know, anywhere. Um, perhaps I could read one very, very short poem. Uh, she wrote some prose poems as well, which are quite long, but a lot of her poems are really quite short. And my poem is um, deliberately quite short lined and quite short st stanzas. Um, and here's um, one poem, it's in obviously English translation, vertigos or meditation on something that ends. The lilac sheds its leaves. It falls away from itself and conceals its old shadow. I should die from things like this. So that perhaps gives a sense of what she was on about. Mm. Um, and um, it's only in recent years that um, her work's been more and more translated into English. Um, there are a few different translations are around. Um, but there are a number of things that um, I'm really interested in because um, I'm a bit of a night person. Um, I don't take speed to stay up at night. I just tend to, um, um, I just, uh, you know, if I stay awake, I can stay awake for quite a long time. I'm not an insomniac, um, but I can stay awake at night and often do some good work at night. So that sort of thing interested me. Um, the fact that um, she was attracted to the Alice in Wonderland ideas, I mean, it's probably not all that unusual for that time um, in the you know, 60s, but um, when I was a kid, I loved all that sort of stuff. Um, and I guess questioning um, who one is, um, who one can love, you know, they were issues that I went through, you know, for obvious reasons. Um, and also questioning language itself um, and also trying to distill things is a good lesson for me because um, sometimes I can write quite long poems and think to myself, I could distill this. Mm. And she certainly does that. I'm just conscious of time. I'd like to keep mm -hmm. talking, but uh, I think we perhaps should get onto the next poem. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, this is um, the last poem I'm going to read. Um, from Wild Curious Air. And if you think you recognise um, some of the phrases in it uh, from what I've previously read, you'll be right. The poem is um, completely constructed um, from phrases and words um, in the rest of the book. It's called Undo Everything. I resurrect the dead for a second when I close my eyes. It's hard to remember what it was once like. I look at each plant for belief or breath. Sorrow isn't something I'd name. Knots of possibilities, I weave them out of themselves, tenderly, curiously, like a charm. There are cold things I can't brush away. Hold my hand when it gets even scarier. I remember the taste of water, 
Sky's beautiful dry shadows fall on my pages through the familiar spectrum. Even the yellow door is sighing. I taste the old gall in ink between the page, the garden, the sea. I collect dust, but only certain dust. I taste myself, apples or phlegm, this heat on my skin. I ask emptiness to fill me. The body betrays what it loves by saying it loves its betrayals, reciting its own typos, juggling amazements, as if God never left or arrived. Everything hurts, so maybe that's the case. Boredom is my alibi as I trace lines around zero, but it'll look as though I'm meant to be here doing something important. Really, it seems almost good. I have boxes of medicine for everything. I think about my dreams of mutiny and burn the poems. I'm leaning into the darkness yet again. I think about walking as something to do. The natural state is turning as if there was more space in the continuum. I see you shadow or bright in these shiftings, something unexpected, which isn't sorrow. Yeah, um, I'm glad you, uh, you introduced the poem that way because uh, you had me doing a fair bit of jumping backwards and forwards between poems because I picked it up and then I was trying to find how many lines I could find that were in the other poems that, that mm. you, uh, you were reading. I found eight. Mm. Um, but it, it sort of raises this question of, uh, of language, of using the same words in a different combination. And I'm very intrigued by that. Um, uh, obviously, it's, a, it's something very deliberate, but you, you get a completely different meaning when you do that, don't you? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. And, um, and yeah, it's, it's also speaking to that idea of fragments, and when you put the fragments together, um, you can generate different sorts of meanings. So, um, and it links to some of the ideas I had with this book. It's a, it's a short book, but I wanted um, things to talk to each other throughout the book. The idea of the symposium, um, this idea also, um, and it does talk back a little bit to um, the previous book, History of What I'll Become, and that's why I started off with that um, Sappho poem. Um, because um, that also has that idea of the fragment. And to think about the fragment, um, because, you know, we think in fragments all the time. You know, we sort of have a little thought and we then jump to here, to here, to here. And, you know, we sort of put together the story of our life in different sorts of ways, which is often fragments of memory, some of them probably false. Well, not false memory, but, you know, reconstructed. Um, so, and this is not the last poem in the book, um, but it's towards the end and it tries to talk back and to think about how you might reframe some of the other poetry ideas, you know, the other poems and where that might go. Um, and um, of course, in a sense, it's, it's an undoing, and hence undo everything. And sometimes you've got to undo things and redo them. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I like it very much. Um, I mean, you're in conversation with other poets. You're quoting from other people's works, but you're in conversation with your own, your own work and your previous books. And mm. there's, there's multiple conversations are going on here. Um, and what that tells me is that, that the conversation never finishes and it, and it, and it needs to be open-ended. Um, and and that we can approach it uh, with new insights, even if we use the same language. Mm. Um, so yeah, I, I, I relate to that. Um, I did do um, a, a collaborative piece with a poet in, in Pittsburgh some years ago where he took words from some of my poems and I took words from some of his poems and we put them together in a poem together and it was, it was a lot of fun. Mm. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, I have done that once or twice with other poets. And in the end, the poem that we collaborated on was kind of a Renger idea. Um, it was the poet Andrew Burke. And the complete poem is in a book of his. But then in um, my book, Viva the Real, I just, you know, I let that poem stand in his book. And that was all fine. And we agreed and that was all cool. And then what I did was I extracted the bits that I wrote um, and put them together as a different poem in Viva the Real. So that the poem, you know, had two, you know, there were two different poems, but the words had 
different lives as well and then ge generate it again, different meanings. Mm. Um, so it was an interesting experiment. I wouldn't mind trying it again. <laughs> if, is anyone out there? <laughs> um, but, yeah, I mean, I, did you feel, how did you feel about um, that sort of process, David? Oh, well, uh, it was a poet um, who who had released a chapbook and I'd read the chapbook. I'd sat, sat with a chapbook for a, for a week and I was blown away by it. And so I, I wrote a, an acrostic piece that uh, referenced the title of the chapbook and I sent it to him and, and one thing led to another. And then he said, well, look, uh, give me, let me have some of your work. And, it's almost like another poet's interpreting something that you you have put together and mm -hmm. come up with something but he 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 did it in a way that was really interesting um and and then when we put the two together they they worked um and they might not have worked but mm -hmm. they worked and uh so it it, it was a one off thing but I, I would also i'd like i'd like to do it again but you know mm -hmm. the timing's got to be right and the yes, the, yes. the sensibility's got to be right and all those sorts of things have to have to fall in place, but um, I think it, it you know, I, I've, I really love the Peter Bukowski, Ken Bolton collaborations uh, in the last couple of years. And I can see the possibility of those kind of collaborations if you get two sensibilities that can work well together. Mm. Yeah, well, Ken's done that before with other people as well, John Jenkins and- um, Pam Brown. Yeah, yeah. so, um, you know, th those, I mean, they've, they've got to be able to work. You can't force it, even if it's someone you do admire, it yeah. might not gel at all. Yeah. Um, and I did try and do it with someone years ago and we could never make it work. So we just said, yeah. love you, but, you know, <laughs> <laughs> let's call that one quits. <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right. We got another poem. Yeah. Two more. Yeah. Um, and this one, we're leaving um, Wild Curious Air and going back to um, a book of mine called Brink, which sadly seems to have, I think, disappeared. Um and the poem, in case you're wondering, has got um, a very brief quote from a Bob Dylan song, but you'll know it when you hear it. Our epic want. It wasn't in the sound of trees or boom gates. They'd been burned. The juice had cracked. Our clothes became tighter. They were black and blue or shot in red, infrared. It had become a virtual lucky dip, but no love. You couldn't bet on it anymore, not even on the lamb or offshore. We dialed it up, but we'd forgotten the hands, their pink skin allure. We were somewhere in the torn fabric, parting the seams. We'd given up on claustrophobia. Raw music stunned us. It hurt more than love. Did it have cult status? Could we make a hash of it? There were lists making it official, but we weren't on them. We thought we were owed, but we couldn't find the candles or the gun. There was no meat raffle, no magic jumping castle. Someone had done the old switcheroo, they said. We looked up flues and into blowholes. We found a world of thumb, foam and fug and acetylene. The rain rattled us, but it was the wrong size, too big, too grey. There was nothing between it like love or even its, its simulacra. We disposed of our means. Where was our famous attention to detail? It wasn't in our helmets. We'd botched it, we thought though the dials worked. We had all the gear in the back, the bogus green passports. We remembered the abstractions in the boot. They'd crushed the mushrooms. The result looked like omelette or autumn leaves. There were Asia clouds, but it didn't smell right. We expected immunity, but it didn't come. It seemed almost effortless in the end. We felt a rush. This wasn't tactics anymore, neither was it pure. We bought a Geiger counter at a garage sale, which blew our minds for a while. We felt good, but a little flaky. Esperanto was no good at all, nor Urdu, nor English. We could have been in a novel by some Russian. We're idiots, babe, that old song. We sat in the backyard and it sang us. We walked down the street. We saw a dog, some fallen oranges. The train passed us. We'd got the timetable wrong. We dreamt of last things first, getting behind ourselves like an urge or a fault. But there was plenty more and we still had the air around our skin. So I'm going to take my cue from, from the title. My children demonstrate an epic want, <laughs> and undoubtedly they feel that there is a disconnect um, and often a huge one between that want and what they get. Yeah. Is this poem exploring the space between 
want and reality and at the same time acknowledging that the want is an endless thing whether it is met and that there will always be plenty more yeah i think that's certainly a good way to put it and it's certainly also about um uh what people think will get them what um they want or need um, or what's important perhaps is um, another way of putting it mm. um and the way things just simply don't work um sometimes in hilarious ways um and sometimes in quite serious ways and all the sorts of things that we in a sense arm ourselves with to also protect ourselves from the things that we don't want while we're looking for the thing that we think we do want <laughs> oh. um so um there's and i guess this kind of a um this is sort of a sad humor and all of that um mm. yeah and um and so that's why the poem ends on you know um just walking down the street um and thinking about you know something like a dog and some fallen oranges rather than you know sort of you know will a geiger counter help us or uh, i don't mean there's all sorts of other you know iterations of what you might mean by a geiger counter and by helmets and guns um, yeah all those sorts of things or even sort of dumb things like meat raffles yeah i mean there's so much going on mm. um and and this is what i was uh, alluding to a bit earlier on that that um your poems are not very often narrative or linear but but more collages where thoughts or images rapidly follow one another um but are not overtly connected it, 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 as a reader it gives me a bit of work to do i find and, and, and I, I, when I do the work, it's really pleasurable. But if I don't do the work, then I miss a lot, I think. Well, yeah, and um, I'm not trying to make people, you know, do things they don't want to do. Um, I'm hoping that, a, that people might spend a bit more time with the poem than simply one reading. Mm. Um, if they don't, well, okay. Uh, and also that as the poem moves along, that at least the um, words, phrases, um, in this case, sentences, not all of the poems have sentences, but these are a series of sentences, mostly um, there's some isolated phrases. That there's, there's pleasure involved in simply reading yeah. those and thinking about that, and then we move on to something else. And again, it seems to me that this is, um, often the way that our thought moves. Um, yeah, it goes from one thing to the next. And um, how do you make those connections? And, you know, why did I start thinking about what I'm going to cook for dinner and in the end thinking about um, the mind-body problem? Yeah, just taking an example. Um, yeah. and, um, and maybe I'm, I should clear out the backyard and, <laughs> um, and oh, there's a dog barking and... Why did why don't I have a dog and about pets and you know you could go on and on and on and I mean there's a bit of a connection there in what I just said but some of these things um you know they do they do jump I mean I have other poems that don't do this yeah I, I was just wondering you know I mean it, it it does reflect the way that we think we we skip about with our thoughts but um when you're writing poetry is this is this a stylistic choice um or, or um, is it that you have so many thoughts around the poem that, that you want to sort of put them in and juxtapose them and, and see how they work? Well, certainly, I, you know, I put things in. Um, and this poem, again, it's um, quite an old poem um, written in Sydney. The book was published while I was in Adelaide, so it's a good example. And... Um, although some of the lines stayed in it, um, it, it certainly changed a lot. And so I'm always testing out the poems to see how they might work. And it's not sort of, I mean, in the, in the initial draft, it's often sort of putting a whole bunch of things together and seeing if they work. Um, but in the end, sometimes it's unpacking it and seeing what um, does actually work, at least in my mind. Um, and if it's if it's a style, yes, it's possibly a style. Um, it, it does relate to the way I think. 
I think. Um, and also, I guess, although one can be at times a bit definitive, um, it goes back to my feeling of my own tenuousness um, about making pronouncements. I mean, I don't think poems are propositions and sometimes I read critique of X or Y poem or poet or book where certain poets seem to think that poems need to be propositions and they need to be able to be explained. And um, I'd much rather prefer poems that, you know, are open, unfinished, um, and can keep on being re-explained and re-examined um, and then just enjoyed for the language. Yeah, you know, I've got lots of books that I read and I think I'm not sure what that poem is about, but I really liked it. Yeah. Um, and they're the poems that I go back to rather than the obvious ones that, well, this is a poem about a tree um, and it's about a tree and that's what it's about and it's not about anything else. I mean, obviously, if it's a poem, it really will be about something else because it'll be about the language, it'll be about sound, it'll be about the rhythm. But, um, yeah, and, I mean, I'm obviously, I mean, in this poem, they're, um, they're couplets joined together. Um, they're not sort of, you know... Um, even in the couplets that they jump, but there's there's um, a bit more close connection between each um, sentence or series of sentences in the couplet than the next one. Mm. Yeah. So um, yeah, it's I guess in the broader sense of style, in the way that um, I think about things um, and put things together. But as I say, I'm not trying to make things. There's no point in being obscure for the sake of being obscure. Um, that's certainly not what I'm about. And I must say, I think, um, I think I'm less obscure than some people like to think. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, it's yeah. not so much obscurity as, you know, the mystery. That's yeah, yeah. In the, in the yeah, poem. and, you know, we need a bit of mystery. Yeah, well, I, I'm not sure the poem would be a poem if it didn't have some element of mystery in it. Mm. Yeah, I mean, even, you know, the really well-known poems, you can go back to them and, you know, I teach certain poems um, every year, um, you yeah, know, the really well-known poems, and there's always something you can get out of them. And students, particularly if they're coming to it raw, will sort of tell me things about the poem. I thought, I never would have thought of that. That's really interesting. Mm -hmm. yeah. And we're going to finish up with a, a newish poem. Yes, Yes, this is um, it's going to be published, but um, not published yet. So I thought I'd just give it a little um, outing. Um, it, and it's got an epigraph from um, Peshaw's The Book of Disquiet. I'll just read that out and then I'll read the title of the poem and the poem. So the epigraph, clouds. They are the principal reality of the day and I'm as preoccupied with them as if the clouding over of the sky were one of the great dangers that fate has in store for me. Okay, the poem. And the world is breath. I set sail every morning, unhooking day from night. The window is a breath. The north is scudded with patches of white. A cloud is a breath. Not all days have clouds, but here they are. The passing train is a breath. A cold wind blows over the summer. The fallen nest is a breath. Every return is a pattern. One map undoes another. I stare into a clear dark sky as planes fly across night in a diagonal. The interrupted dream is a breath. I'm wandering with ghosts, ghosts against screens and machines. There are no clouds. The sky seems to be humming. A receipt from an auto teller is a breath. The air is full of leaves and wind, but no clouds. A parking space is a breath. A gum tree against the clear blue seen from the bus is a breath. Memory is every breath. Ghost clouds float in the hot blue above the parklands. Every second is for something. Forgetting is another breath. Well, the world can only exist for us whilst we're breathing. Mm. Um, so without, without breath, we don't live. And so there is nothing. So everything... Everything then is a breath. Mm. Um, is this is this poem just saying that, or is it uh, thinking about mortality, or is it going elsewhere? Well, I mean, obviously, um, it's thinking about um, mortality and breathing for humans. Um, 
it also relates to the idea of um, clouds as being, in a sense, um, a kind of a breath um, of the sky um, and weather. Um, and I've been thinking a lot about clouds. And as I said before, I've, I've um, written um, a long series um, of um, ideas that I put together in a poem about clouds. Um, and I was also obviously thinking of the breath insofar as poetry goes, um, because poetry depends on breath as either red or the, um, the breath of lines as they turn. Um, so it was certainly um, a comment on poetry itself and what can go into poetry, and of course everything can. So it was also about that. So even things like auto tellers and buses and um, clouds and, um, you know, trains going by, um, they can all be parts of poems. And um, although I think it's probably not common these days, but I think when I first started writing poetry, people sort of said things about, oh, you're writing about suburbia or ordinary things. Why are you doing that? should be you know, about sort of big things. And I'm thinking, I'm writing about where we all live. And this is where we live, where we breathe. Um, so that's what I was thinking about. Is it in part um, referencing COVID-19 and everyone in ventilators and the struggle for breath now? Um, that wasn't um, completely conscious, but, you know, I think, you know, I'd probably be, um, reading about that as well, but it wasn't specifically a conscious thought. Mm. Um, but yes, it, it could could well be, um, because all that was going. I did write it um, last year, and um, but uh, it, it, as I say, it, it's in partly it, it is actually to do with what poetry can do, um, as well as you know just you know our own you know, life, humanness and what we need to, to live. Um, and I guess our anxieties around, well, as you say, what COVID certainly does to the, um, the lungs. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I love to read poems out loud and, 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 and what I like about this poem is the word breath, the way that it repeats and that as you're reading it and you're breathing it, um, and it's repeating and it's kind of part of that sort of whole breathing process. It's encapsulated in the poem. It's beautiful. Mm. Mm. Yeah, yeah. And as I said, that's why it's, it's, it's about poetry as much as about um, the lungs. Yeah. Um, and, um, you know, it, it has a regular form, relatively regular form, and um, uh, it, it yeah, uses the re repetition, which... Even say if you're writing um, in fragments, um, certainly things like repetition um, can tie things together. Mm. Even though each time something, and of course, as Gertrude Stein has not suggested, there's no, it's, it's not so much repetition; it's insistence. Yes. Um, because every time you repeat something, it's slightly different, and but you keep insisting. I'm insisting on breath. Yes. Breath, breath. breath. But what does it mean in each little context? Mm. Thanks so much, Jill for sharing poems and insights on the theme digressions ambling and detritus poetry is filled with we've done a lot of ambling and digressions in this podcast um, when this video is posted it will include links to jill's books so look out for that uh, we're going to squeeze in another podcast before the end of the year please check in again towards the end of december when poets corner will feature philip hall on the theme this quarrelsome god and x reads the hebrew bible see you then <laughs>